Okay, so this is me. I'm Elvin Ramskoga. I'm 14 years old right now. I actually have birthday in about two and a half weeks. And I love programming as a hobby. And I also love grading compilers, fiddling around with custom programming languages. That's really fun. And I love birds. Okay, let's get into the talk. First, I want to talk about C macros to understand where macros come from. What are they? They're preprocessor preprocessor directives. Maybe you've seen things like include in C programs. They start with a hash and then some name. And these are C macros. They're snippets replaced by the C preprocessor. And they're nothing more than string replacement. So you can't do complex syntax matching. That's only possible with, with Rust. They look somehow like this. This is an example. We have pi is 3.1415, blah, blah, blah. And macros can also take parameters, like in this case, circle area, takes a radius, and squares it and multiplies with pi. This is a more complex example. It takes the same macros and it calls the macro. Macro calling looks like this, which has put the name. It looks like a function call, but it's actually replaced by the preprocessor. What do you think this is going to print? No, you don't have to pull out your calculators. This is the output. And that's, that's correct, but there's a problem. If we add plus two in this position, it doesn't output what we expect it to output. And this is the first problem. I calculated the correct, the correct result and was 153 point blah blah, but it actually outputs 27.708. What is the problem in this case? Well, they're just simple string replacement. So if we look at what it, what it replaces it with, it's pi times radius plus 2 times radius plus 2. And we can fix this by just adding parentheses around. And this will output the correct thing. And I have another example here, which is a very simple macro called sum. We actually don't need it, but this is just for an example. The parentheses are placed correctly here. Everything works fine, except for this. Because this is going to give us the same problem as before. It's 1 plus 2 times 2. So it will print 5. That's also not correct, because it should print 6. That's the second problem. And as you can see here, this is what it, what it expands to. It's 1 plus 2 times 2. And that's, of course, wrong. And we can apply the same fix as before, just saying parentheses around here. And this works fine. This is what it expands to. And Rust solves all these problems. You don't have to think about string replacement. It correctly groups together expressions, so you never have these problems. But I ex actually experimented with C macros. And I found out that they can do some very crazy stuff. Let me show you something here. This is a hello world in C. But if I say include Java, this is a file that I've written, I can actually say public class main like this and copilot actually knows what I'm trying to do. This is valid code. I can run it. It outputs hello world. And if you don't believe me, I can change this here. And it still works. I look into this file. This is the entire Mac thing. I actually got that from Reddit, I think. 
it was in C++, but I copied it for C. It was a bit hard, especially with these things here to correctly reduce the syntax tree, but it works. And I even prepared something more, Let's say type script. Function main console dot and now look at this. I even get autocomplete. I can now say the talk. Hello world. And it compiles and outputs the correct thing. But if I say console error this outputs the second thing and this is now red. And if we look into this file, it's actually just one single macro called function, which does all the things needed for this to work. OK, we said Rust solves all these problems. Now let's take a look at Rust macros. What are they? I'm 100% sure you've already seen them because they're in the Hello World example and they're called using the bang symbol. This is the Rust Hello World, and as you can see here, print line is a macro, and this bang symbol means that it gets called as a macro. If you don't have this symbol, it won't work, because the compiler will say, a print line is a macro, but you try to call it as a function. Now, the thing is, in Rust, there are two types of macros. There are procedural macros and there are declarative macros. And the interesting thing is they're called in both in the same way, both with name, then bang, and then an argument list. Procedural macros are basically sub-programs, so you write Rust code that gets compiled first and then executed while compiling your program. The problem with this is that you have to compile code two times, which is slower than just one time. And that is what declarative macros solve. They're like function definitions, just a bit different. But they don't need a second compile cycle. Because they're just like functions or types, they're in your program. They don't need a separate create. They're just inserted by the compiler. And I don't want to talk about procedural macros today. That's a very complex thing. But it's but about declarative macros. And for simplicity, I'm just going to call them macros. OK, a very basic example. How do they look like this? You have macro rules, bang, say hi to. This is the name in that case. This is the argument list. And this is the content of the macro. And macro variables always start with a dollar symbol, then the name of this variable, colon, type. There are multiple types like expression in this case, or statement, visibility, attributes, all these things. And they're called like the print line macro using say hi to, bang, and then the arguments. The problem is they have to be defined before being used. You can have recursive macros that works because when calling, they're already defined. You can even define a macro above this or below this. You can define a macro below here, call it in here, but it is defined when, when this gets inserted because we call it below the definition of this other macro. And I have to apologize for my title. It was just, it just fitted so well. It should have been syntactically macro rules the world. This was my title, macros rule the world, because that's true in Rust. And this would be syntactically correct. Do you see the difference between this? Just a few similar chars, but the other one would be correct. Okay, how well are they built? This is macro rules, say hi to. In this case, this is the name. And this is the macro content. If we, this is call signature, 
how it is called. And this is the body of the micro. And you can actually have multiple of these blocks, but I will get to that later. Okay, a call signature. What is a call signature? It's basically a list of tokens. You need to use matching bracket pairs, which are parentheses, brackets, and braces. They can have patterns like we saw before using dollar name colon type. And this is an example. It has to be called using this is an example colon expression semicolon expression. And every literal token, like in this case, this is an example colon and semicolon, they have to be directly inside you. And patterns can be like an expression or visibility or statement or whatever. And they can have multiple tokens and they're correctly parsed by the compiler. The problems are solved that C macros have. If we change it, if we change the signature to that, that's a bit simpler than before. And this is the implementation. You see print line, blah, blah, expression times expression two. And we call it using two plus expressions, two additions. Rust correctly groups them together. We don't have the problem like in C, where it's just inserted the simple text replacement but it groups, it, it groups together correctly. And the same thing also applies for return values. So if we say like, if we replace this print line with expression plus expression two, and we call it and we say times two, it will also work correctly. Okay, there is more complex syntax in macro headers. We have like, a variable amount of tokens, so-called repetition or optionals. And a simple example is the vector macro. It looks like this. We can say dollar parenthesis, then again, some list of tokens or patterns, closing parenthesis, separator star. And inside, we can also do it the same way, dollar open parenthesis, content close parenthesis star if we just try to use dollar item on its own this will not work because it will say variable still repeating at this step that will be a compiler error and you can actually use different kinds of brackets when calling the macro you can use parentheses you can use brackets like in this case or you can also use braces these ones this is also a very simple example, which says, which just prints all the expressions passed inside you. Limited by comma in this case, like you can see here, and any amount. We can now change this to plus to require at least one. This will still work perfectly, but if we don't specify anything, the compiler will say, unexpected token in macro expansion or something like that. I don't know exactly the error message, but this will not work. Now the problem is if we want to have a trailing comma, this will also not work because it will say expected end of macro invocation, but it got the comma. So what do we do? This is where zero or one or also called optionals come in. You can Instead of the star, you can use the question mark to say either nothing or the things inside the parentheses. Now, I talked about multiple headers before. You can have multiple call headers in the same macro. You need them for alternatives. Rust macros do not support alternatives on its own, like you can say a repetition and then either this or this. That doesn't work. You need to use multiple call headers. And this is an example print named with a colon some expression. And we print it using a equals blah and the expression. Or b e and c. This is the other output. Then. 
And another problems, another problem that C micros have is the so-called hygiene. And this is basically that when we pass something to the macro that has the same name, a variable that has the same name as something defined inside the macro, we will override it inside the macro and don't have access to it other later then. But in Rust, we don't have this problem. Variables are scoped. And in this case, we cannot access number. It will say cannot find value number in this code because the macro hygiene is defined outside of my function. We can solve it by passing a identifier token. That's also a different token type. And another way to solve it is to define the macro in the scope of the variable. Like if you need a macro only in one function, you can define it after the variable has been defined, and then it will correctly access the variable. And this is the fixed example from before. OK, debugging in Visual Studio Code is pretty weird. It's very inconsistent. I tried some examples, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't really. It works very well at the call side. So if you like pass the statement inside to the macro, then everything works well. But it doesn't work always when you try to debug inside the macro. I have an example here. If you try to set the breakpoint, for example, at line 25, this doesn't work in this case. But in line 33, this works fine. They can be used across files. But it's not as easy as with functions where you can just add a pub keyword and then in a different file add a using at the top. Because they have to be defined before being used, you actually have to use an attribute called macro export because pub is not supported on macros. And this is an example. I have a file macros.rs. The macro my macro, which takes two, two expressions and adds them and prints them. And this is the attribute called macro export, which is added to my macro. And in the main.rs, we can say mod macros and just write after it my macro blah blah. We do not we do not have to import it because it's automatically imported if it's in the same crate. If you import something from a different crate, you actually have to add a use blah blah. Like in lazy static, I'm pretty sure you've already seen lazy static if we work with regex a lot. Then you say use lazy static colon colon lazy static, and that imports the macro so you can use it. There is a feature that is called Decl macro. This is a nightly feature. Oops, I forgot the bracket here <laughs> to update that. And it's an unstable feature that basically works like functions, where you can say macro blah blah. So it's just a like function definition. With functions, you have fn name. And with this feature, you have macro name. And in that case, you can actually use pub and import it. So they don't have to be defined before being used. And I looked at some internals, and it seems like it works so that the parser, the Rust program is parsed. Then it's checked and then outputted. And the parser, which turns your text into the syntax tree, does some magic, and it it basically inserts a placeholder in the position where you call the macro and parse later when he has the information from the from where the, from where the macro comes. And it can be exported and imported with pub and use. And this is a simple example. We have pub macro my macro. Just like with functions, the argument list which is the same as the macro call header we saw before, and then the body which gets inserted. And this is the main file with feature decal macro. 
mod macros, use macros my macro, and then we can call it. If we don't add this line, it doesn't work because it's a declarative macro, a declared macro. And I'm going to give you some examples now, some very basic examples. In this case, we have the hello world example. This is what every Rust programmer writes, it, writes as, it, as his first script. And if we look at this, this is the macro. And if I press command, you can see it highlights it and I can go to the definition. And as you can see, it's actually just a macro in the standard library called print line. It matches it if you don't pass any arguments. It just prints a new line. Otherwise, it takes any amount of so-called tokens. TT is a token tree. It's either a single token, like comma or colon, or matching parentheses or brackets with anything inside, like multiple tokens, whatever. And it calls the print function with the format args macro. And I have prepared some examples here now. In the slides, I showed you this macro here. This is not really usable for production. So I thought we could use something that we learned before so-called repetition. I'm now going to try to rebuild this macro so that all these things here work. If we now look at this, no rules expected token B, I deleted this, and also no rules expected D. Let's add some simple repetition here like this, limited by comma. So everything that's inside here, any amount of times, and between all with a comma. Now it still doesn't work because we only expect an A at this position. So we can say dollar name. Ident. It expects any identifier here. And this almost works now. We have a problem with this, this here. We have to always put it inside here. And now I just see yeah, I can show you this error. Variable x is still repeating at this step. So this doesn't work. We have to add the repeating thing here too. Now we have a, another problem, unexpected end of macro invocation. Missing tokens in macro arguments, which is here. So it says here we don't expect any more tokens but we pass tokens here. How do we fix this? We can add an optional token here, a comma. And now this works. If we run this, run. As you can see here, it correctly outputs all these things, but it doesn't output the identifiers. It always says A. We can replace this with a format arc. But what do we put here? If we say name, we'll give it an error, cannot find the value a in this code because it tries to access the variable a. Now there is a macro that's built into the Rust compiler and it's called by this. And if you if you watched carefully, then you will see there is something missing. We'll say expected function found macro string. If I forgot the bang symbol here. And now everything works fine. The stringify takes any amount of tokens and it returns the string representation. If we run this now, A, B, C, D, E, and the correct values. So everything works fine now. This is a very simple example of a macro, but it can sometimes also be useful to have these kinds of simple macros.
But I have a more complex example here. This is a pattern you will see really often. Up in color, some variants, and then display for color, and just some string formatting. You can see this really often in many crates. Or click this. And you can say let color red in this case. And we say print color. This works. But it's not very beautiful. As you can see here, we have a lot of code that we actually don't need. But we have it every time we write this kind of enum. So for example, I have written a macro called fmt enum of macros. This is a file, but I will get to this enum later, to this macro. And we can now say fmt enum. I can move in this color enum. Delete this here. This now says no rules expect the token comma. Why? Because I have to say equals. In this case, it's like this. And then I can say equals green and blue, yellow, copilot, copilot even knows this. And like this. Here we can say R G E and isn't that much more beautiful? I don't need this anymore. This is way more beautiful than the old version we had before. But it does still work. Let's say inline this here. Can add some more prints. Red. And it still works like before. So, how does this macro work? Don't be scared of this. This is normal things you see when writing macros. But I commented it, and this is the first thing. You see these two match, which the code highlights them. And this says everything inside here any amount of times without a separator. If we don't put anything before the before the star symbol, it has no separator. Then we can have any amount of attributes. This is called meta. A meta thing is basically the thing you put between these brackets when defining when defining attributes. Then we have visibility. This can be either nothing or pub or pub crate, all these things. Then we expect the literal token enum. Then the name is an identifier. And then these phrases here, which are these things. And then we have any amount of enum variants separated by comma with an optional trailing comma. This is what we have seen before. It's an optional comma after the list of comma separated values. And here we have attributes again for the variant and then variant name. This is a bit complex. It's basically this here. We say we have an optional tuple variant these these parentheses here with any amount of name colon type also separated by comma but we need a minimum amount of them like we need at least one and we also can add attributes to this and the same thing for struct variants which just uses these Races. And then after this, the equal symbol, which is this symbol here or this, a literal, 
which is the format string. And then after this, optionally, this here. And this is an interesting thing. We have an optional, in, and inside this optional, we have a percent sign, an optional percent sign. What would happen if we would move this out of here, like this? This is still valid, everything here. But we can now say, this, we can now say here, percent. This is valid, but we don't want this. What we want is actually inserting it inside here, which gives an error here, because it would expect, if it sees a percent sign, it expects a parenthesis, because it knows it is inside here. So this has to exist, this optional, so it expects a parenthesis after. And this parenthesis is just a list of expressions separated by a comma with an optional trailing comma. Move this again. And that's the entire macro header. And the implementation is not that complex. It's just what we have seen before, the enum with all the variants. And this is the trick. I'm using some kind of pseudo alternatives here, because Rust will give an error if we have both this and this. It would be valid for this head to put both, but it's not valid here anymore to put both. Then we implement display for this name. And this is basically just write. That's the format string here. And these are the format arguments. And that's the entire format enum macro. And I have a very interesting tool here, which is called cargo expand, which expands this macro. That's a tool you can install using cargo install expand. Cargo expand, I don't know the name exactly. I will send it later in the YouTube chat. And if we run this, we will see exactly what it outputs. This is what comes out as the enum. It's exactly what we had before. I can remove the hello variant. Exactly what we've seen before. And pretty much the same in here. And this is something very interesting because the right macro is a macro itself here. And this gets expanded to f write fmt, core fmt arguments, new version one, all these things. And that's actually what happens in print line two. It says print an empty string, then a new display for the color, and then uh, a new line. And this is the same for these two cases, this time with RGB and here with red. And I talked about lazy static before. I have another example for cargo expand here. This is a very simple lazy static example. The static ref example string is hello world to string. This does not work when we don't use lazy static because to string is not a constant method. You can see here if we add const, this would work, but it's not a constant method. So we need lazy static in this case. And we can print it using the tref operator example. And this actually works, as you can see. And if we expand it, this is what comes out. It's a lot of code. You can copy it into a file. This is what comes out. A feature prelude import. This is some Rust thing 
it's like the all the often used things like vector or option you don't need to add usings for them you can just say like this and this works because rust imports this automatically when it uses the standard library macros and now this is my code that I've written here. Use lazy static, lazy static. And this, everything from here to here is what the lazy static macro gives me. This is a lot of implementation detail. I don't really understand what it does. It's a very complex thing with init things and uninitialized memory. I don't understand that. And this is the print line macro again. And we can actually look at the definition of this. It says any amount of meta of attributes. And then we have static ref. These are literal tokens, name, type, expression. And then any amount of tokens again. That's basically so you can have multiple, I can say two. Like that. And this also works because inside this, which is this here, it passes all these tokens back to the lazy static macro, and that's macro recursion. So, first we go in here, we pass everything into this here. We look at the first thing and we pass the rest back to this macro, which in return passes back into here. And these were my examples. And I have some takeaways for this talk. Macros are a very powerful tool. It can help you a lot. They are safe. They're way, way better than C macros like hygiene or the grouping things, they do have problems, like having to be defined before being used, but that is going to be solved soon with the decal macro feature I talked about before. And sadly, there are no alternatives in macro headers. I imagine having something like macro rules, so I can say I want any amount of either A or B. That's how I think about it. That would be cool. I can call it using A, B, B, A, A, B, A, B, and so on. But that doesn't work currently. But they're very useful for your everyday's work.